Hey everyone, this video is the beginning of my coverage of Fables, the comic by Bill Willingham. This is one of the most requested books I've been asked to cover here on my channel, and I am finally getting to it. I absolutely love Fables. It is one of my top 10 favorite comics ever. I love the ensemble cast of characters and the long-form storytelling where we get to see them evolve and change over time. Now, Fables first started publishing in 2002, and it wrapped up in 2015 and spanned 150 issues. Although, after a seven-year hiatus, Bill Willingham started publishing Fables once again. There was supposed to be a 12-issue arc, which is now halfway through, that is called The Black Forest, which will continue the story. Beyond the initial Fables series, there's also a spin-off book called Jack of Fables, which spanned 50 issues, another spin-off called Ferris, another spin-off covering Cinderella, and beyond the comics, there was also a video game called Wolf Among Us by Telltale Games, which was very fun, and there's also going to be a sequel to that game supposedly coming out this year. Now, there has never been a Fables TV show or movie, although there have been talks about it, but nothing has happened. And it would be awesome if it did. I would love to see Fables on HBO or something like that. Now, there was a show called Once Upon a Time, which in many ways kind of seems like a ripoff of Fables, but that show is not Fables. But yeah, Fables is a really fantastic series. I'm super stoked to be going through it with you all. So let's dive into it. First, I'm going to kick it off with a, some background knowledge on the world of Fables, and then we shall dive into the story for Volume 1. Fables Volume 1 Legends in Exile Written by Bill Willingham, art by Lan Medina, inks by Steve Lelola and Craig Hamilton, and colors by Sherilyn Van Valkenburg. Before I dive into issue 1, I want to give you a little bit of a Fables background and set up the world of Fables we're going to be spending time in. So in the world of Fables, all the fairy tale, folklore, and nursery rhyme creatures and characters we know from children's stories like Snow White and Beauty and the Beast and the Big Bad Wolf and Pinocchio and Prince Charming and Rapunzel and Cinderella, etc. Well, they all lived in a world called the Homelands. The Homelands consisted of many kingdoms in many different lands filled with all kinds of people. Well, in the comic fables, at some point in the past, all of these fables were driven from their homelands by a mysterious and deadly enemy called the Adversary. Who this Adversary is, is a huge mystery that looms over this series for the first several volumes. The fable characters being forced to flee, eventually found their way over to our world, the real world. Specifically, they moved to New York City, and they formed a secret society in New York's Upper West Side they called Fable Town, and that is where they all live. They live among all the ordinary, regular humans. All the fables refer to the humans as Mundies or the Mundane. All of the talking animals and things from fairy tales that we might know, like the Three Little Pigs, well, they would be unable to blend in with human society, and they would very much stick out in Manhattan. So instead, they live in upstate New York on a place called The Farm. One other thing I want to point out is if the fables are immortal or not. The fables in the book can in fact die, but it is very hard. In fact, the more popular and remembered a fable is among the Mundies, the more powerful they are and the harder it is for them to die. So a character like Cinderella, who is pretty much universally well known, she is very durable. But a less popular fable like, I don't know, one of the three little pigs, he can die more easily. More will be revealed as the story goes on, but for now, let's dive into the opening issue. Fables Issue 1 Legends in Exile, Chapter 1, Old Tales Revisited, in which we meet many of our principal players and get just the first hint or two of some of the myriad troubles to come. Our story opens in New York City on the corner of Bullfinch and Kipling Street, in a place called Fabletown. Jack Horner leaves a cab and heads for the Woodland Luxury Apartments. 
Jack Horner is a character derived from various fairy tales. However, unlike most of the other fables in this series, he comes from many different characters and is sort of an amalgamation of them all. Since many protagonists in fairy tales tend to have the name Jack, think Little Jack Horner, Jack and the Beanstalk, Jack and Jill, Jack be Nimble, Jack o' Lantern, Jack and the Giant Killer, etc. Well, Jack Horner here is all of them, one in the same. Jack in this series is often portrayed as a trickster con artist, always looking for a quick way to make a buck. On this day, though, Jack looks very concerned. He runs to the Woodland Luxury Apartments, which is an apartment complex where many of the Fable Town residents live in. Trusty John is the doorman at the Woodland Luxury Apartments. He lets Jack into the building and says hello to him. Trusty John is another fable. He comes from a fairy tale story called Faithful John, published in 1812-1815. It is a story about a servant named John who serves as king and queen, and he goes to great lengths to protect them in the story, and he somehow gets turned to stone because of it. But through magic, he is brought back to life by the king and queen, and he lives happily ever after. Anyway, that's his story, but Trusty John now is just a doorman at this building. Jack Horner, though, he runs inside. He passes by someone else named Ambrose Flycatcher, who appears to work as a janitor in the building. Flycatcher says hello to Jack. Jack has no time to talk as he's in a rush. Now this Ambrose Flycatcher working as a janitor is another fable. He is the Frog Prince. You know, the one from the story where a person was cursed by a witch and turned into a frog until a kiss from a princess would free him and from his amphibious form and turn him human again? Well, this is him. He is Ambrose Flycatcher. And even though he is human now, he sometimes still eats some flies. Another guy there in the building is Grimble. He is the security guard at the Woodland Luxury Apartments front desk. He is actually a troll from the tale of the Three Billy Goats Gruff. He has a glamour spell on him, though, that makes him look human. Otherwise, he would have to go live on the farm because he wouldn't be able to blend in. Now, Grimble, even though he is actually asleep most of the time at the security desk there, like right now, for instance, he supposedly always still knows what is going on. Jack Horner, he keeps running through the building. He eventually runs into the office of Bigby Wolf. Bigby Wolf is one of the most important characters in Fables. He's even the main protagonist in a video game called Wolf Among Us that was made by Telltale Games, which by the way was fantastic, and a sequel game is going to be coming out in 2023, which I am very excited about. Bigby is actually the character we know as the Big Bad Wolf, the one that terrorized various fables like Little Red Riding Hood and the Three Little Pigs. Bigby Wolf has since reformed, though, and over the years he has slowly won over the trust of a lot of the Fable Town residents. He is currently the security officer or sheriff of Fable Town. Well, Jack Horner, now in Bigby's office, is tired and he is huffing from all the running he has done. Bigby asks, You look out of breath, Jack? Been climbing beanstalks again? Jack replies, No. Blown down any piggies' homes lately? Bigby says he's got no time for this. Jack tells him something terrible has happened, and he needs Bigby's help. We go elsewhere, just down the hall from Bigby's office, to the business offices of Snow White. Snow White is, of course, the famous Snow White from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Snow is the director of operations of Fable Town, and she supports the mayor of Fable Town, King Cole. She is his deputy. Despite being part of New York, Fable Town has its own little government that oversees all Fable matters. Snow White, right now, is having a meeting with Beauty and the Beast from the famous story Beauty and the Beast. Snow White has called this meeting with them because Beast's appearance lately has gotten very beast-like and it's becoming a problem. Beast has little horns protruding from his head, but Beauty still looks beautiful. Perfect blonde hair, rosy cheeks, slim figure. 
Beast says to Snow White that it's not his fault he is looking more beast-like lately. The truth is, well, him and Beauty have been having marital troubles. They've been married for almost a thousand years by now. Beast, he normally actually looks completely human, having long reverted away from his beast form, but whenever Beauty gets mad at him, he slowly reverts back to looking more beast-like, which is causing trouble. Snow White says that their marital problems are not any of her business. Snow says she barely has enough money and manpower to run most of the basic government services of Fable Town. She can't afford marriage counseling for the two of them. She warns Beast, though, that their most vital law in Fable Town is that no fable shall, by action or inaction, cause their magical nature to become known to the mundane world, or the Mundies as they refer to regular humans. Snow tells Beast that he needs to get his transformations under control. If Beast can't maintain a normal human appearance, he must purchase a glamour from one of the witches that lives in the woodland luxury apartments. That way he can hide his beastly appearance. If he can't get his transformations under control and he won't buy a glamour to hide them, then he will have to live upstate on the farm where all the other non-human fables live. Beauty and the Beast protest. They did not escape the homelands with their fortune intact. They can't afford a glamour powerful enough to hide Beast's curse. Snow White tells them as sympathetic as she is, she can't help them. They will have to do the best they can, like many others do in Fable Town. Beauty and the Beast, they are angry and they want to appeal. They want to take this up with the mayor of Fable Town, Mayor King Cole. Let me explain who King Cole is. King Cole comes from the nursery rhyme called Old King Cole, and it's pretty short, so I might as well just read it all to you in its entirety. The nursery rhyme goes like this. Old King Cole was a merry old soul, and a merry old soul was he. He called for his pipe, and he called for his bowl, and he called for his fiddlers three. Every fiddler he had a fiddle, and a very fine fiddle had he. Tweet twiddle dee, tweedle dee, with the fiddlers, oh there's none so rare, as can compare with King Cole and his fiddlers three. So that is the nursery rhyme where King Cole comes from. Within the world of fables, King Cole is the long-serving mayor of Fable Town. He has no special abilities, but he is very well liked, which is why he tends to win elections for mayor quite easily. His view is that the king, or mayor in this case, should be a servant of the people more than a ruler. So back to Beauty and the Beast and Snow White now. Beauty and the Beast want to appeal and make their case to the mayor directly. They feel it is not fair that they have to face this burden of Beast needing a glamour and they want help or an exception to the rules. Snow White tells them that they are free to make an appointment with King Cole and make their case, but she tells them what will happen. She says, he will listen, he will be polite and say the right things and be genuinely sympathetic because he is a nice man. But the moment that you are out the door, he'll ask me what I want to do about it. He does all the formal glad handing and making official appearances and does the ceremonial stuff, but I do the real work of running our community. And for better or worse, you just had your appeal to City Hall. Beauty responds, you, you divorced your prince centuries ago. You have no idea how hard it is to keep a marriage going so long. We just learned here that Snow White is divorced. Remember, she was married to Prince Charming in her story. We'll meet Prince Charming later. While this conversation is going on, we see this flying monkey in the background of the office with wings. His name is Buffkin. He comes from the Land of Oz, which is from the Wizard of Oz. Remember those flying monkeys in the Wizard of Oz? Well, Buffkin is one of them. In Fable Town, he acts as the librarian. He spends his time reading and drinking booze. He can be helpful when he wants to be though, but most of the time he'd rather just be drinking. Someone would have fired Buffkin ages ago, but he's the only one that can kind of make sense of the library's filing system. Back to the conversation at hand though. Beast tells his wife to not take this all so personally. 
Beauty replies, What do you mean don't get personal? After she openly criticized our married life? And just who is she to criticize anyone's personal life? After what I heard about her tawdry little adventure with those seven dwarves. Snow White grows immensely angry. A clerk in her office named Little Boy Blue comes along, and he ushers Beauty and Beast out of the room. Beauty says to the boy, We weren't finished yet. But, he tells them, if they hoped to survive their last comment, they should leave. He says, never mention the dwarves to Snow White. Beauty and the Beast eventually do leave the office. Now, who is Little Boy Blue? He is a more obscure kind of fable character. He comes from a nursery rhyme that goes like this. Little Boy Blue, come blow your horn. The sheep's in the meadow and the cow's in the corn. Where is that boy who looks after the sheep? He's under a haystack, fast asleep. Will you wake him? Oh no, not I. For if I do, he'll surely cry. So that is the nursery rhyme where Little Boy Blue has his origin. Within the World of the Fables comic, Little Boy Blue is a clerk in Snow White's office. He is also a skilled musician, especially with his trumpet. He occasionally tries to play in jazz clubs in the city. He lives a typically nerdy teenager lifestyle, avidly reading comic books and playing board games. As Little Boy Blue sends Beauty and the Beast away from Snow White's office, Bigby comes over and talks to him. He asks if Snow White is free. Little Boy Blue says she is, but she's in a foul mood. We jump elsewhere to Godfrey's Steakhouse. Prince Charming is there. Prince Charming is the ex-husband of Snow White, but he is also the ex-husband of Briar Rose, aka Sleeping Beauty, who was his second wife. But he's also the ex-husband of Cinderella, who was his third wife. So Prince Charming kind of gets around and is a real sleazeball. We see him here, he is wearing a suit, and he does look handsome and dapper as ever. He just ate a huge meal in this steakhouse, and he is flirting with a waitress named Molly Greenbaum. Prince Charming is so supernaturally handsome, he can easily take advantage of women. The waitress is blushing as she is talking to Prince Charming. He asks for her phone number. She tells him that, you know what, her shift ends soon, and She's just tempted to ask him to come home with her right now. Prince Charming, with his face smoldering, says, That's a delightful idea. Dear Miss Molly, but uh, I'm afraid that would create a slight problem for one or both of us. See, I came in here without a penny to my name, and my plan was to eat a filling meal and then skip out on the check. But if I'm to go home with you, well, we're suddenly faced with a rather awkward moment. Molly, the waitress, asks, You're broke? Prince Charming answers, Completely and utterly. Molly then asks, But you'd like to come back with me to my place? Prince Charming replies, That is currently my fondest desire. Molly, she thinks on it and says, Well, I guess I can afford to pick up the check since I would have been stuck with it anyway if you'd snuck out. Prince Charming to this says, You're a good sport, Molly. I adore you already. The two of them eventually leave the restaurant and head back to Molly's apartment. We jump back over to the offices of Snow White. Bigby is talking with her. They are colleagues and have a friendly relationship. Bigby breaks the news to her that her sister Rose Red might be in trouble. Her apartment is a mess and there is blood everywhere. Bigby says that Jack Horner visited him in his office this morning. Jack. He is actually the boyfriend of Rose Red, and he is the one that discovered the scene at her apartment, and then he rushed over immediately to tell Bigby. Bigby thought that Snow White would want to know that her sister is potentially in trouble. Now, let me give you some background knowledge on Rose Red. She is Snow White's sister. Now, I was thinking when I read this, I don't remember Snow White having a sister. Well, apparently. There is the popular story we all know called Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and in that story, Rose Red did not exist. But there is actually an unrelated, more obscure, less popular fairy tale called Snow White and Rose Red. 
it is completely separate from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. They are not the same Snow White character, they just both happen to have a character named Snow White in it. But in the case of the Fables comic, the author is combining both of these Snow Whites and saying they are the same. So Snow White in Fables has this sister, Rose Red. I was curious, so I looked up what the original Snow White and Rose Red story was. Here is a basic summary of that original fairy tale story. So Snow White and Rose Red were two little girls living with their mother. A bear came to visit them, but the bear was friendly and he befriended the girls and the family and the bear would come back frequently and sleep in their home and the family grew used to him. But when the summer came, the bear told the girls that he must go away for a while to guard his treasure from a wicked dwarf. Later on, Snow White and Rose Red ran into that dwarf. The dwarf's beard was stuck in a tree. They cut his beard to save him, but the dwarf was ungrateful for the help because now his beard is all cut. Then they ran into the dwarf a few more times and they saved the dwarf from peril. But each time the dwarf was saved, he continued to be ungrateful. Eventually, the two girls and the dwarf and the bear ran into each other at the same time. The dwarf tried to convince the bear to kill the girls. Instead, the bear killed the dwarf with one swipe of his paws, and the bear, who apparently was under a curse, then turned into a handsome prince. The prince was turned into a bear by this dwarf, and by killing the dwarf, the prince was freed from the curse and turned from a bear back into a human. And then at the end of the story, Snow White married the bear turned prince and Rose Red married his brother. Anyway, that is the original story of Snow White and Rose Red, and it kind of sound kind of lame to me, but that's just me. Anyway, back to the Fables comic now. So Snow White has just learned her sister Rose Red is missing and potentially is dead. Snow White knows that her sister Rose Red is always been a little bit of a partier, but she is concerned when Bigby tells her all about the blood at her apartment. She tells Bigby that she is coming along for the investigation. We jump back over to Prince Charming. He and that waitress he picked up, Molly, are getting it on back at Molly's apartment. Molly is enjoying herself, and she tells Prince Charming that he is amazing in bed. Prince Charming knows he is good in bed, he tells her, I always believed a truly accomplished nobleman should hone his coxmanship every bit as his swordsmanship. In each case, one should know when it is better to thrust or parry or bind, when it's time to withdraw or repost, and of course when it's time to finally commit all to the deep plunge. So while Prince Charming is taking advantage of this woman at her apartment, we jump back over to Bigby and Snow White. They arrive at Rose Red's apartment by way of taxi. Jack Horner is there. He was guarding the crime scene for Bigby. He lets them into Rose's apartment and he tells them it's horrible. Inside the apartment, it is a mess. Furniture is destroyed. Things have been thrown everywhere. And blood is all over the place, on the walls, on the furniture, everywhere. The blood was also used to write something on the wall. It says, no more happily ever after. Bigby, he investigates the crime scene. He uses his wolf smell to try and pick up anything he can. One thing of interest he finds in Rose Red's apartment is that there was a padlocked freezer door. After Bigby pours over the scene for many minutes, he eventually decides to arrest Jack Horner, the boyfriend of Rose Red. Jack is surprised by this. He is the one that brought this to Bigby's attention in the first place. Snow White asks, is he really the one? And Bigby replies, we'll see. Fables Issue 2, Legends in Exile, Chapter 2. The Unusual Suspects, in which our intrepid detective delves deeper into the mystery of the missing fable, and a prince is reunited with his old lady love. Bigby is in his apartment in the Woodland Estates. In his apartment, Bigby wakes up Colin, who is one of the Three Little Pigs. You know, the one from the story about the Big Bad Wolf and the Three Little Pigs? Well. This pig here is Colin, and he is not so little anymore. 
Colin is the pig whose house was made of straw, the one that the big bad wolf easily blew down. Well, Colin has been crashing on Bigby's couch for a while now. Bigby tells Colin that there's a truck going upstate to the farm in an hour, and Colin needs to be on it. He can't keep coming to the city and crashing on his couch. Colin argues that Bigby still owes him for destroying his house. Bigby replies, That's ancient history. All I did was scatter a few bales of straw. Colin lights a cigarette and tells Bigby that he has to let him stay here, he argues, because by staying here I'm a living symbol of your last redemption. Who can continue to doubt you've reformed after one of your old nemesis, a succulent piggy, survived sleeping in your apartment? I hate it up on the farm, Biggs. I'm a sophisticated pig and I belong in the city. Bigby tells him, nevertheless, if he doesn't go to the farm, he's going to turn him in, as he is not allowed in the city. Bigby then asks, You want some breakfast before I kick you out? Colin asks, What are you having? Bigby answers, Ham and eggs. Colin replies, I take it all back. You're still a monster through and through. Across town at Molly Greenbaum's apartment. Molly is still sleeping in bed, but her date, Prince Charming, who was planning on crashing there for a few days, well, he stepped out to run some errands, but he left a note for Molly. The note explains that he has gone to retrieve some luggage. He asks if Molly can do some laundry for him, and be sure to carefully follow the washing instructions. He also helped himself to the spare key to the apartment, as well as some money from her purse. He'll be back later, and he'll be staying here for a few days. Back over to Bigby. Bigby is meeting with Snow White. They talk about Snow White's sister, Rose Red, and Bigby's investigation into her disappearance. Bigby says that the blood at the scene was Rose's for sure. He can smell it. Snow White asks if maybe one of the Mundies did it, meaning the normal humans. Snow says that Rose often partied with the Mundanes. Bigby says that, nah, whoever did this was most likely a fable. He notes that in the mirror, in blood, there was a phrase that said, No more happily ever after. That is a phrase that most likely only a fable would write. Snow White says that her money is on Jack Horner, that he did it. Bigby says that Jack is always a pain in his ass, but he's not sure it's him. He has nothing else to go on for now, though. Snow White has an appointment with her ex-husband, Prince Charming, but she says she will check in with Bigby later. Elsewhere, we see two new characters. One of them is a fable named Bluebeard. Bluebeard is from a French folktale, first published in 1697. In the folktale, it is about a nobleman who murders his wives. He marries women and then kills them. He's based on Henry VIII. In the Book of Fables, Bluebeard is known for being a nobleman as well as a serial killer who murdered his past wives. This is known by all, but he has since reformed, and he has also been given amnesty for his past crimes. He is enormously wealthy. Nearly single-handedly, he supports the Fable Town government, which has no way to levy taxes, and thus relies on donations from wealthy patrons like Bluebeard. And Bluebeard, he is even able to afford top magical spells. One such spell makes his entire palace from his castle in the homelands be hidden inside a small room in the woodland luxury apartments. Bluebeard is fencing against Cinderella. He is training her. Cinderella is of course the same one from the classic fairy tale, whom I'm sure a lot of us know from the Disney movie. She's also the third ex-wife of Prince Charming. Well, this Cinderella is also a little bit of a badass, and she actually works as a secret agent for Bigby. Much later on in the series, she even has two spin-off books, one called Cinderella from Fable Town with Love, and the other called Fables Are Forever. Both of these are parodies of James Bond movie titles. So while Bluebeard and Cinderella are fencing, they discuss Cinderella's loser ex-husband, Prince Charming. Cinderella also gossips about the rumor that Rose Red is supposedly dead. 
carved up like a Christmas turkey, and that Jack Horner most likely did the deed. Bluebeard is very surprised to hear this, as he is very fond of Rose Red himself. He ends their lesson, and he storms off. In a diner called I Am the Eggman, Snow White and Prince Charming are having breakfast. Snow White tells Rex, I'm dying to find out how you burned your last bridges with every royal in Europe, and who you're sponging off these days. Prince Charming, he's the one that called this meeting with Snow White. He wants to ask for her help. He needs money, so he has decided on a little scheme to auction off his royal title, plus all of his lands and estates to whatever Fable wants to buy. And he wants Snow White's help to get the word out and get this process started. The problem with this is that Prince Charming's lands and estate still reside in the homelands, which of course have fallen under the adversary's control. So Snow asks Prince Charming, why would anyone pay good money to buy lands that have fallen under the adversary's dominion, or a royal title that has no authority in this world? Prince Charming explains, That's the beauty of my plan, Snow. What are we, less than two weeks from our annual Remembrance Day celebration? This is the one time of year when everyone gets nostalgic for the homelands and starts believing we actually have a chance of winning them back someday. Snow White says that she will not help in this scheme. Doesn't he remember why she divorced him? She slept with his sister! Prince Charming defends himself, saying, That minx seduced me! Snow White, she leaves, but she tells Prince Charming before she goes that her sister Rose Red has gone missing, and Prince Charming should definitely be on the list of suspects. Prince Charming should expect to be questioned by Bigby later. Later on, we see the questioning of Jack Horner by Bigby along with Snow White. Bigby asks how long Jack has been dating Rose Red. Jack answers, uh, four years. Bigby asks, but not four years straight, right? In fact, Bigby, he remembers the two of them having a huge public falling out a year ago. Bigby also recalls that at last year's Remembrance Day celebration, Rose Red was there and she appeared to be dating Bluebeard. Jack explains, She only dated him to make me jealous. He's the one you should question. You know his reputation with women. Maybe he got mad when she left him to come back to me. Bigby can't help but bring up old grievances of Jack's during the questioning. Bigby says, You're always trying to beat the system, Jack. There was the time you tried to steal Numblin's seven league boots to win the New York Marathon. Jack says, hey, it was the Boston Marathon. And at least I tried to do it out of state to divert attention away from Fabletown. I know how to keep things secret from the Mondays, okay? I don't run with those fanatics who think we should all come out of the closet. Bigby, he then brings up another incident of Jack's, he says. And what about the time? You tried to raffle off the map to your remaining magic beans. Also, your whole giant killing phase. Jack explains, Look, all of that happened before the general amnesty, which means it can't be brought up again now. Snow White comments that Jack is right. Jack continues, Or does that protection only apply to granny gobbling wolves who don shepherd's clothing to become low-rent cops during the exile? Bigby and Jack, they start getting very heated in their arguments, but Snow White starts crying and yells for them both to stop it. She then pleads with Jack and asks, Is my sister dead? Did you kill her? Jack says of course he did not kill her. Bigby, he is going to check out Jack's apartment. Jack says to go ahead, he has nothing to hide. Bigby and Snow White then head over to Bluebeard's to question him. Might as well see what he has to say. Meanwhile, the pig, Colin, that Bigby was talking to earlier, gets nervous on the street because Colin did not end up going back to the farm. He stayed in the city, and he's trying to lay low. He's worried that Bigby or Snow might see him, but for now, Colin manages to avoid being detected. Snow and Bigby arrive at Bluebeard's apartment. Bluebeard's odd-looking manservant lets them in. The manservant is named Hobbs. 
His name is in reference to him being a hobgoblin. Despite Hobbes' appearance, he is calm, dignified, reliable, and an expert manservant. Now, Bluebeard's apartment seems very small on the outside, but when Bigby and Snow go inside, the apartment is massive. Bluebeard, with some magic spells, managed to fit his entire castle within this apartment. The magics allow him to fit a big place inside a small place. Bigby asks Snow White how Bluebeard is so rich. Snow White explains that Bluebeard was one of the few fables, lucky enough to get out of the homelands with his fortune intact. He also ran an underground smuggling ring, getting fables out of the homelands once the adversary took over. He helped and smuggled those fables in for a large price. Hobbs leads Bigby and Snow White to Bluebeard's office. When Bluebeard sees Snow White and Bigby, he invites them in to sit down and make themselves at home. Bluebeard asks if they are there to collect his annual contribution to the Fable Town government. He usually gives the payment to King Cole directly at the Remembrance Day celebration, which is coming up soon. Bigby says that is not why they are here. Bigby takes those bloody photos of Rose Red's apartment, and he shows them to Bluebeard, and then he straight up accuses Bluebeard of killing Rose Red. Bluebeard is outraged to be spoken to this way. Bigby says that he'll speak with the murderer any way he wants. Bigby says, that's what you do, isn't it? You marry them and then you gut them. Bigby asks where Bluebeard was at the night in question, and how was he involved with Rose? Bluebeard then reveals that he and Rose Red had a secret relationship. At last year's Remembrance Day, they became engaged to be married. Bluebeard gave her a sizable dower repayment. Rose Red insisted that they keep their engagement secret for on an entire calendar year before they finally get married. Bluebeard, he gave Rose lots of money and then he made her sign a contract so that she would fill her side of it and actually marry him. Bluebeard, he shows the contract to Bigby and Snow White. Bluebeard, though, he says he wants this case solved and he is willing to give one million dollars for the discovery and capture of whoever is responsible for Rose's murder. Fables Issue 3 Legends in Exile Chapter 3 Blood Towns In which the boys make a big mess, more blood is spilled, and a determination is made about a missing fable. At Rose Red's apartment building, Bigby is in the apartment below Rose Red's and he has brought Flycatcher and Little Boy Blue with him to help. Bigby wants the two of them to recreate the massacre at Rose Red's apartment with some pre-measured packets of blood. He wants to see if they can figure out how much blood it would take to recreate the scene of the crime. He thinks it will help him determine if Rose Red is alive or not. The apartment that they are in is the exact size of Rose's. Well, with their orders, Flycatcher and Little Boy Blue get to work, while Bigby heads off on some other matters. Snow White visits King Cole. They discuss the Rose Red case and her disappearance and Bigby's investigation. King Cole tells Snow White that he received a complaint from Bluebeard about how Bigby accused him of murder? Snow White does admit that Bigby did accuse Bluebeard but she does feel that Bluebeard could in fact be a suspect, especially with his past of murdering wives. Although usually Bluebeard would murder them after he married them, not before. Snow White also says that her and Bigby talked to a few other suspects. One of them was Fro Totenkinder, aka the Black Forest Witch, aka the witch from stories like Rapunzel, Sleeping Beauty, Flycatcher, as well as Hansel and Gretel. She is one of the leaders of the witches in Fable Town and one of the main magic users. When Bigby questioned her, he asked her, Can't help but wonder if you turn back to your old eating habits. What do you say, Granny? Growing tired of the taste of gingerbread? It did not seem like Fro Totenkinder killed Rose Red, though, and that line of questioning went nowhere. They also questioned Prince Charming, but that too did not go anywhere. Bigby also questioned Snow White herself and any motivations 
she might have for potentially killing her sister. They did have a falling out a while back, but Snow White most likely did not do it either. King Cole listening to all of this says that either way, he wants all of this settled by Remembrance Day. That is the day that they receive all their donations to run the Fabletown government. And the Fables all want to be able to celebrate the old days, and a murder investigation could put a damper on things. Elsewhere, over at Bluebeard's home, he is sharpening a knife, and then he leaves his house with a tray of food. All of this is somewhat peculiar. Elsewhere, later on, we see Bigby arrives at Snow White's office with Jack Horner's computer. He wants Snow to look into Jack's computer for him and see if she can find anything. Snow asks, why can't Bigby do it? And Bigby explains that computers hate him and he is incapable of operating anything more complex than a toaster. Bigby, he then heads downstairs to check in on Jack, who is still in a prison cell. Bigby is going to give Jack his lunch. When Bigby talks to the security guard, Grimble, and tells him he is there to give Jack lunch, Grimble tells Bigby that Bluebeard already brought Jack's lunch to him. He said that you authorized it. Bigby grows concerned. He begins running down to the prison cell, and he arrives just in time to see Bluebeard strangling Jack and torturing him and trying to get info on Rose. Bigby, he turns into his big bad wolf form, and he warns Bluebeard, Drop the knife and get away from the boy or I'll rip your throat out. Bluebeard and Bigby argue. Bluebeard, he really believes that Jack is responsible for Rose being dead or missing. Eventually, though, Bigby makes Bluebeard calm down, and Bluebeard, he volunteers to take Jack's place in custody in the prison cell for now for his violent outburst, and Bigby lets Jack out of the cell and will let him go home for now. Later on, Bigby fills Snow White in on the latest developments. He tells her all about Jack and Bluebeard fighting down in the cells. Bigby, he also talks about the Remembrance Day celebration coming up, and Bigby implies that the two of them would go together. Snow White is a little confused. She asks, When did we decide I'm going to the gala with you? For that matter, when did you decide to go? You never go to the Remembrance Day celebration. Bigby answers, I can't avoid it this year. If there's any chance to work everything out, I need to be there, and you have to go as my date. It's all very complicated, and I can't explain it yet, so just go along. Now, if you'll excuse me, I gotta go home and change. Back at Bigby's apartment later, Bigby receives a call from Little Boy Blue and Flycatcher. They finish their reenactment of Rose Red's crime scene at the apartment below hers. They tell Bigby how many pints of blood it took them. Bigby thanks them for the info, and then he orders them to go back and clean the place fully, as well as Rose Red's place as... He no longer needs to preserve the evidence. A few hours later, Bigby goes back to see Snow in her office. Snow White tells Bigby what she learned by investigating Jack's computer. She says that Jack was involved in some sort of get-rich-quick scheme. He started in an internet business called DreamWorlds with a Z, dot com, some kind of startup company that he's been trying to take public for nearly a year. He lost lots of money on it. Snow wonders, where did Jack even get the money to lose? Bigby, he then tells Snow what he learned about Rose Red's blood. He says that the amount of blood at Rose Red's crime scene was way too much for a normal human to lose. He explains, the average adult female has a little more than nine pints of blood. Irreversible shock occurs when 40% or more of that volume is lost. I just heard that a minimum of five pints of Rose's blood was spilled in her apartment. That means that there's no hope that Rose is still alive. I'm sorry. Fables Issue 4 Legends in Exile Chapter 4 Remembrance Day In which everyone dresses up to the nines and old stories are retold and the wolf takes a swim. It is now time for the Remembrance Day celebration where all the fables gather for an annual ball where they remember their lost homelands and pine for the day when they might return. Beauty and the Beast arrive at the ball. Beast must be wearing a glamour or he's got his transforming under control 
as he looks fully human right now, no horns. Trusty John invites Beauty and the Beast in. Prince Charming ended up making a deal with Snow White, and he decided to hold a lottery for his estates in the homelands. The tickets sell for $100 a ticket, but you get 50 bucks off if you buy five at a time. Sure, the winner may never be able to actually return to the homelands and utilize those estates, but hypothetically, if they ever do overthrow the adversary and do get to return to the homelands, all of a sudden, the winner of that lottery will have inherited quite a bit. They will have all of Prince Charming's estates, as well as his title, becoming a prince or princess themselves. A few of the fables can't resist participating in this lottery for a chance to win their own kingdom. Beauty, she wants to buy some tickets. Beast says that they already have their own lands and castles forever lost in the homelands they can't access because of the adversary. Why would they need more? Beauty explains that she wants to buy some of these lottery tickets because all those lands Beast mentioned were his lands and his title. She was just a peasant girl who married into money. She wants something of her own. She says, if I win, I'll be a princess in my own right. Prince Charming is talking to Snow. He loves to see all the action in the lottery for his kingdom. He's gonna get rich off this. He asks Snow, how much have I made so far? Snow says, as of this morning, we were closing in on 300 grand, but sales have picked up today. I'd be surprised if we haven't doubled that amount by now. Prince Charming comments, lovely. Who would have thought that so many would willingly spend so much for a slight chance to win absolutely nothing of substance? The two of them talk some more, but Snow White is still cold to Prince Charming as he incredibly annoys her. Eventually, she heads out on her own, but she tells Prince Charming to enjoy his final night as a former somebody before he officially becomes just another nobody, once he loses his titles, you know. Now comes the part of the Remembrance Day festivities called the Sacred Reading. In the ballroom, King Cole tells the history of the fables to everyone in attendance. He gives a speech and he talks about all the thousand separate kingdoms that they all once belonged to, all of the many different people and occupations. He says, from the grandest the Lord to the lowliest peasant girl, they were all for the most part strangers to one another, but they became united when the adversary invaded. We see images of all the fables fleeing an invading army and trying to help each other to safety. None of the fables know who the adversary is. King Cole explains, Beyond the farthest shores of Never, the adversary lived in a remote kingdom, ignored by other powers as his strength and ambitions grew over the long centuries. Some say he was a mere woodland sprite, while others claim he was once a god, thrown down from the vast heavens when his corruptions had become too great for his lofty brethren to tolerate. And after he'd conquered his own lands, putting each of its former kings to the sword, he turned his unquenchable appetites in our direction. King Cole explains how the adversary's attacks first started. At first, the adversary attacked the Emerald Kingdom. The Emerald Kingdom is where the Wizard of Oz takes place. The other fables in other lands were sad when the Emerald Kingdom fell, but they didn't intervene because they were always a little bit odd in the Emerald Kingdom and they were always so far away. It wasn't their business. And then the Kingdom of the Great Lion fell. This is in reference to Narnia. King Cole says, And yet we still did nothing because we always found the old lion to be a bit too pompous and holier than thou for our tastes. But then after that, one by one, other kingdoms fell, and lands fell under the adversary's dominion. If the Fable Lands united sooner, we might have been able to stop him, but it was too late by then. Eventually, all the Fables started making their way to the mundane world, the one place the adversary seemed to take no interest in. King Cole, after explaining all of this some more, he ends his speech by saying, And here, we are all united by our common enemy, we have learned to set aside old grudges. We forgave our many grievances to make covenant with each other. And now, predator and prey, prince and pauper, we are all of a single community. 
allied in our undying memory of the homelands, and the unshakable determination that one day we will return to win those lands free of the hated one. Ladies and gentlemen, lift your glasses and join me, please, in drinking this toast to the homelands. All the fables and attendants raise their glasses and clink them and drink. We see elsewhere, beyond the Fable Town Ballroom, other fables are also toasting on this Remembrance Day. We see a family of mice sharing drinks. We see at the farm some of the more inhumane fables also drinking by a campfire. Even though some of these creatures do not live in Fable Town proper, they are still citizens of Fable Town, and they are still equally determined never to forget the homelands. The party in the ballroom in Fable Town continues. Cinderella is talking to Pinocchio. Pinocchio is, of course, from the famous story about the wooden puppet banged into a real boy. Right now, Pinocchio is in his real boy appearance. Cinderella asks how Pinocchio is doing. Pinocchio seems like he is in a foul mood. Pinocchio is angry. He hates this celebration, but yet he comes every year. He says, one of these days, that blue fairy that turned him into a real boy will show her face at one of these events, and he's going to kick her ass. Cinderella is confused. She asks, I thought you wanted to be turned into a real boy. Pinocchio answers, of course I did, but who knew I'd have to stay a boy forever? The ditzy bitch interpreted my wish too literally. I'm over three centuries old, and I still haven't gone through puberty. I want to grow up, and I want my balls to drop, and I want to get laid. Elsewhere, in Bigby's office, he allows Jack Horner and Bluebeard to go and enjoy the end of the party. He is going to allow Bluebeard to clean himself up in order to deliver his annual donation to the Fable Town government. Bigby, he also wants Jack to deliver a message to one of the guests at the party. Bigby, he then rejoins the party himself, and he meets Snow White. He talks with her, and the two actually try dancing with one another. Snow White tries to teach Bigby how to dance. She tells him to follow her lead and try not to step on her feet. Bigby, he is trying to do this. He is watching his feet very closely. Snow White tells him that he has to look up at her, but Bigby says, But then I can't see my feet! Snow tells him to do it anyway. It looks like he's trying to peek down her dress with the way he's looking now. Bigby, frustrated, says, So? Why would you wear a neckline like that if you didn't want people to look? Snow White quips back. Perhaps women wear low necklines to filter out the gentlemen from the dogs. Those few who can still manage eye contact, even in the presence of breasts like these, might actually have potential. Well, Bigby, he starts making eye contact with Snow White, and he starts stepping on her feet. Prince Charming, watching this, makes fun of them. Flycatcher makes a comment, too, although he's more supportive of Bigby and his efforts to dance. Bigby, he does not like everyone watching him and feeling like he is the center of attention. He tells Snow White that they should leave here and go eat something. Snow says that they can raid the kitchen. She mentions that most of the good stuff has probably been eaten already, but she knows a trick the caterers do. They steal and save the really good food for themselves and lock it up in the back. Then they sneak it home later. Bigby, hearing this, has a light bulb go off in his head. He says that Snow White has helped him solve the final part in the mystery of Rose's disappearance. Rose Rad had a padlocked freezer when Bigby searched her apartment after her disappearance. She must have been trying to keep something from all the fables and mondays she would always have over for her various parties. Snow White really doesn't get what this has to do with anything. Bigby says he knows who killed Rose Red. He tells Snow White to spread the word discreetly to any fables that want to know the truth, and then meet him on King Cole's Terrace after the lottery drawing later tonight. On King Cole's Terrace, Bigby took the opportunity to go for a swim while he was alone. Eventually, after the Remembrance Day celebrations wound down and the lottery commenced, various Fable Town members begin showing up on the terrace. Jack Horner is the first to arrive. Jack is in a good mood. He is a prince now! He is the one that won the lottery for Prince Charming's title and lands. 
and he only bought one ticket off of a lark. A whole bunch of the other fables begin to arrive and gather, and join Bigby there on the roof. Bigby talks to the crowd of people, and then he reveals to them the supposed killer of Rose Red. He tells Jack to bring in the villain. Snow White is surprised. Is the killer here right now? Bigby answers that he knew the killer wouldn't be able to resist going to the annual ball, and he had Jack circulate among the guests to look for her. Jack, he comes escorting a woman with black hair. Bigby, he announces to the crowd, Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Rose Red's killer. Bigby removes the woman's black wig, revealing her red hair beneath. The killer of Rose Red is Rose Red herself. Bigby tells everyone to calm down and stop talking. He says, I'll tell you uh, what she did, how she did it, and why she did it. Fables, Issue 5, Legends in Exile, Chapter 5. The famous parlor room scene, Sans Parlor, in which everything is neatly wrapped up in the end, even though few are satisfied with the outcome. Bigby explains to the crowd in attendance that anyone who's ever fancied himself a detective, openly or secretly, longs for the day he can do the famous parlor room scene. You know, the scene in the movie where the detective gets to reveal who did what, how they did it, and most importantly, how the detective figured it all out. All the fables on the rooftop are eagerly awaiting Bigby's explanation. Bigby, he begins breaking it all down, he says. When Jack Horner arrived at his office from Rose's apartment, Jack took a cab, and Jack ran from the cab to Bigby's office, out of breath. Bigby noted that a run from the street to his office should not have made Jack so winded, so he was already suspicious that Jack was lying from the start. When Bigby arrived at the crime scene at Rose Rand's apartment, he already knew that Jack was onto something and he felt that the apartment looked staged. Since there was blood everywhere, there was no way anyone could have entered or left the apartment without leaving tracks. And Jack mentioned that he had already checked Rose's bedroom and she was not there. So how did Jack get to the bedroom without accidentally stepping in some blood? Bigby also said that everything in the apartment was knocked over, but he could tell that it was all carefully knocked over, almost placed in a certain way. A light bulb and a lamp that fell over definitely would have shattered if it really fell, but it was placed on the ground, and the light bulb in the lamp was still intact. Bigby also noted in the crime scene that Rose's stereo was spared too, not a single drop of blood on it. Rose didn't want her stereo ruined. Also, various CDs, which by the way, this book was written in the early 2000s when CDs were still important to people. Bigby says that various CDs were thrown on the floor and they were also covered in blood. But it seemed like the CDs that were destroyed on the floor were from the back of Rose's shelf. They were her less favorite CDs, but the ones she liked more and listened to more that were in the front of her shelf, well, they were untouched and Rose's shitty toaster from her kitchen was smashed in the middle of the living room. But there wasn't any blood in the kitchen that could have explained how the toaster got there. Snow White interjects, crying. She says, why didn't Bigby tell her that her sister was most likely alive this whole time if he knew? Bigby explains that he knew the crime scene was faked, but he did not know where Rose was or if she was actually still alive or not. Bigby tells Snow that she did help him figure something out, though. Snow White mentioned that the caterers at parties often kept the best food for themselves locked up in the fridge. Well, Bigby knows that Rose Red liked to have lots of parties with tons of Mondays and Fables over to her apartment. Bigby had wondered why there was a lock on Rose Red's freezer door, and that is when he figured out that she was slowly gathering amounts of her blood and keeping them refrigerated until the big day where she would fake her death. And she locked that freezer so that none of the party goers would discover the blood she was keeping in there. 
So Bigby has now kind of figured out the who did it and how they did it, but he hasn't established why they did it yet. Why did Rose Red want to fake her death? And why did Jack Horner help her? Well, Rose Red and Jack were boyfriend and girlfriend. And Jack, he had this get-rich-quick scheme with the internet. And this DreamWorlds.com website he was hoping to cash in on. But he needed money to start, so he suggested that Rose Red could easily get the money from Bluebeard, as Bluebeard always had a thing for her. And once the money started rolling in from Jack's business idea, they could easily get the money back that they needed to pay Bluebeard with. So the two of them, they faked a big public fight, and they broke up publicly. And then once Rose Red was supposedly single, she sweet-talked Bluebeard and eventually got him to agree to marry her and also pay her an upfront dowry on the condition that they get married in one year's time. Rose then gave the money to Jack for his business idea, and Jack lost it all. And Rose and Jack, they then started getting nervous, as the one-year deadline was soon approaching, when Rose would be expected to marry Bluebeard. And Bluebeard, he was known for killing all of his previous wives once they eventually got married, so Rose was fearing for her life. Hence, her and Jack decided to fake Rose's death. Well, that's it. The entire case is now solved. The who, what, when, where, why, and how. King Cole asks Bigby, is there anything else? Bigby answers, nope, I've pretty much told all of it. King Cole asks then, then what are we to do now? Bluebeard chimes in, he states, I'm the injured party here. I've been cheated out of my money and a bride. I'll have satisfaction from these two. His blood on my blade and her hand in marriage, as she is contracted to do. Prince Charming, he chimes in on an unrelated matter. He says that he wants the money from the lottery auctioning off his estates tonight. Snow White, she tells Prince Charming and Bluebeard and Jack and Rose Red to calm down. She tells everyone to go home and stay there. She says the mayor, the sheriff, and I will meet you to work these things out tomorrow and summon you as you're needed, so don't wander off. The next day, we see out there on the street, there's the pig, Colin, sleeping outside the Woodland Luxury Apartments. He is still refusing to go back to the farm and is staying in the city. He looks so peaceful there, sleeping. Anyway, inside of Snow White's apartment, she is meeting with Bigby and she is telling Bigby the plan to deal with everyone. Jack, Rose Red, Bluebeard, and Prince Charming. After she explains her plans to Bigby, Bigby comments that what she has decided makes it so no one is happy. Snow White explains, Yeah, but at least the misery is spread out as much as possible. So what has Snow White decided? How is she going to remedy this for everyone? First, Snow White meets with Prince Charming at the I Am The Eggman diner. She hands him over a check for $20,000 for the lottery sale of his estate and titles in the homelands. Prince Charming is furious. He says that that lottery brought in millions of dollars. Why is he only getting $20,000 for it? Snow White tells him, You should have read our agreement more closely before signing it. It allowed me to take out all reasonable expenses before you get your share. And I am the sole arbiter of what constitutes a reasonable expense. She explains that the lottery money was used to pay Bluebeard what was owed to him by Jack and Rose to cover the cost of the investigation. She tells Prince Charming that he is lucky she gave him the leftovers. Prince Charming, still furious, says none of that was his responsibility, though. Snow White replies, too bad, you should never have slapped with my sister. Now, if I were you, I'd use what's left to buy back your title from Jack. I bet he can be bought cheap and you'd never make it as a poor commoner. Well, Snow White, she is really screwing Prince Charming over, although she is going to set up the day's events in such a way that Prince Charming will basically get his lands and titles back and kind of be right back where he started. For now, though, let's move on. Snow White, along with Bigby as support, meet with Bluebeard in her office. 
She gives Bluebeard back the cash that Rose owed him for their marriage agreement. Bluebeard is happy to get the money back, but he says there is still the wedding to discuss. He expects Rose to still marry him. Snow White tells him that the wedding's off. Bluebeard is outraged. He says he has a signed agreement. Snow White tells him, Yeah, well, one of the provisions of the contract stated that you were to keep the engagement a secret up until the wedding. However, when Bigby and I went to see you during the investigation of Rose's death, you told us all about your deal. Bluebeard argues, Only when I thought she'd been murdered. Only in response to your questions in an official investigation. Snow White doesn't care, she says. So, you broke the contract, making it null and void. You're lucky we are willing to reimburse you the money you've lost. Bluebeard, he stands up and says, I won't stand for this. But then Bigby interjects and adds, And I would have no choice but to take back the money and reinstate the charges against you for the attempted murder of Jack while he was in custody. Bluebeard, he leaves this meeting angry and unsatisfied. Finally, Snow White and Bigby meet with Jack Horner and Rose Red. Snow says that, for now, both of them are on probation for one year, and they owe 200 hours of community service, and they each owe $10,000 in fines. Rose says that they don't have that kind of money. Bigby tells them, You'll have it by the end of the day. My sources tell me, ex-Prince Charming is willing to pay at least that much to get his lands and titles back. So, essentially, the $20,000 Prince Charming has, well, he'll give it to Rose and Jack, who will then use it to pay off their fines. And Prince Charming will have his lands and titles back and will be a prince once more. Jack kind of bummed here in this sasks. So that's it? No one ends up with anything? Snow tells them, you guys end up with your freedom, which is more than either of you deserve. Finally, after that long day, Snow White and Bigby talk on the roof of the Woodland Luxury Apartments. They are preparing to turn in for the night. Snow White comments, No one's happy, but at least, maybe, we've kept them from killing each other. Bigby says, That's good enough for me. Snow White tells Bigby that he's a decent detective. She also adds, though, There's still one thing I don't understand. Why did you need me to be your date at the Remembrance Day celebration? Bigby, he tries to brush off the question, but eventually, after Snow White's insistence, Bigby admits, Should be obvious, I, uh, I wanted you to go to the damn dance with me as my date. Snow replies, Seriously? You were too shy or afraid to ask me to go to the gala with you, so you pretended it was business related? Bigby says that it he was hoping she'd find a chairman. Snow, she makes it clear to Bigby that the two of them are merely just colleagues and nothing more, and he should never try that again. Bigby tells her, Okay, lady, I got the message loud and clear. And with the sun setting, we now end Volume 1. All right, so that was volume one of Fables, and I absolutely love this opening volume. The artwork is great. The overall story with this murder mystery was really fun, and I love all the world building it does, and also just establishing the overall concept is great. The concept of these fairy tale creatures living in our world in New York City in this secret society is just awesome. So, yeah, in terms of the ensemble cast of characters, I find them all to be so fun, like Prince Charming being a jerk, having all these ex-wives, and hitting on this girl and sort of using her so that he can stay at her place was amusing. Jack Horner and his various schemes. Bigby Wolf is an interesting idea. The fact that he's the big bad wolf, but he is reformed, and now he's this detective investigator for all the Fable Town residents was fun. The fact that Snow White is in this position of authority is also very interesting, and in how she is Really the one running Fable Town. I love some of her interactions with Beauty and the Beast and some of the jokes that were going on there. So there's just so much in here that is really great. And I thought this intro volume did a good job introducing us to everyone 
and having a compelling narrative throughout. So yeah, I'm going to give this opening volume a 9 out of 10. I really think this book starts out super strong and really establishes everything that is going to be coming in the future. So I hope you all love this opening volume. And next week, I will be back with volume 2 of Fables, where we will travel up to the farm.